Here are six ways to fix broken wires or to join wires for new electrical work, starting with the basics and working our way right on up through the pro tips. If you have any damage to your wires that you're working with, the first thing we need to do is some prep and we need to get that taken care of. So if you've got damaged wires, whether that's something that your dog chewed on or that got run over and smashed, something that got pulled apart or sliced, any of those circumstances, you just need to cut off that damaged part altogether so that we have nice clean ends to work with. If you're working with new wire, just snip it to the right length and we're ready to go. To get a clean end, use anything that you need to. I'm a big fan of this guy. This is my weapon of choice. It's a set of six in ones and it's got some overlapping wire cutters built right into it. And that works out great for me. But like I say, use what you need to use to get those clean ends on there. Once you've got your wires cut to length, we then need to separate any wires that are joined like on these lamp wires here. And then with that, we can expose enough wire using wire strippers to get the job done. A beginner's way, or if you just don't have tools, you can honestly use just about anything sharp to do this job. If you do just have a knife and you have a flat surface, sometimes it's really nice just to roll it along like this if you have that option. And then you should be able to pull that off. And you can also, for stranded wires, kind of twist it as you go. But you can see we have a couple of individual wires in here that got cut, which is why using proper wire strippers is usually advisable. Hopefully you're finding this content helpful. If you want to show off your DIY awesomeness, we've got a whole selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, and more that you can check out using the link in the description below. As far as tools are concerned, there are quite a few to choose from. At the basic level, you have your standard wire strippers like this, and these will do a great job. Typically, they're marked with a different gauge, one for stranded and one for solid. There are also universal wire strippers like these from Klein, where you can put just about any gauge wire into there, and it will almost magically just separate that off and cut off that excess just like you need it to. Personally, my favorite are these universal Nipex wire strippers that just use one squeeze and it's good to go. They do a great job every single time. They cost a little more, but if you're doing a lot of this, something like this can save you tons of time. And then of course, the six in ones that I mentioned before also have traditional wire strippers for both solid and stranded built right in. Now that our wires are clipped, separated and stripped, we're ready to join them together. Now the first and probably most basic way to do this that you've probably done before yourself is just to twist those wires together and then wrap them with some sort of tape. Ideally, it's something like electrical tape that's meant for that purpose. And quick tip on that, if you are using electrical tape, make sure you get that wrapped around nice and snug, but do not over pull that or stretch that electrical tape. A better way to do this is to use one of the many solderless options out there for different knots. There is what's called the lineman's knot or the NASA knot. And then here's one that I like where you just basically strip off about an inch of either side, connect the two wires in the middle, and then twist each side together separately and on its own. Once you've turned those four strands into two, you can now connect those two by twisting them together as well. Bend it over to one side, wrap it, and you'll have a pretty strong connection that's much less likely to pull apart over time. Now there are a hundred ways to go about this, so if you have a favorite, feel free to leave that in the comments section below. Moving up from there, we have what's called the WAGO connector. Now this is a little electrical clamping device that can handle most size gauges and you can fit them in there, push down the lever, clamp it in, and then once it snaps in like that, it is secure and solid and ready to go. I wanted to see what these would look like on the inside and how well they actually hold on to your wires. So I actually cut one of these open and you can see inside here that there's a little bus bar that connects all of the wires together and then the clamp pushes the wire down onto the bus bar. And it does a surprisingly good job of not letting anything go and it makes it easy so that if you do want to let it go, you just lift the clamp bar and pull them out and you can swap it just that easy. It should also be noted that these are UL certified, which means as long as you're using them in the way they are designed and according to code, then these are completely up to code and okay to use. These things don't cost very much, but there is a cost for each one of them. So they're one of the more expensive options, but it is probably the fastest and easiest way to connect any two wires. With these WAGO connectors, a lot of people have questions as to how durable they are, how well they conduct electricity, how heat resistant they are, all that sort of thing. There's a pretty great video that I'll link to right up here in the corner by Silver Symbol where he puts all of that to the test. So be sure to check that out and you can see how incredibly durable these things actually are. Probably the most common way to connect wires in all of time and eternity, at least here in the United States, is using wire nuts. Now wire nuts have multiple different names and they come in all different kinds of sizes as well. But the gist of it is pretty simple. We're gonna put our wires in here twist it together and that should wrap all the wires up and help them maintain great contact with one another and it protects them because they're all hidden inside these caps. 
Now using these is not just as straightforward as that unfortunately. A lot of people use these incorrectly and that's what causes a lot of the issues that we see with wire nuts. So in order to use these correctly there's a few steps that you'll want to follow. First of all if you're connecting all solid wires then you want to make sure to expose the uh, roughly the same amount of wire about a half inch typically on each of the wires and then once you've got them all there I think it's helpful to just snip the ends to make sure the ends of them all line up just perfectly. Once you've got that then there are two schools of thought and if you read the instructions on these one bag or box will vary from the other. The different brands have different recommendations. But you can either twist them together beforehand and put them in, but most people that I've talked to and most electricians have commented that it's ideal to actually put them right into the wire nut without stripping it and then twist the wire nut on and that will twist up the bare wire inside. Now the part that most everybody agrees on here is you do need to keep twisting that wire nut until the insulated sections of the wires wrap around twice. I always like to give a little bit of a tug test but if you've done this properly it's even hard actually to do the tug test because you've wrapped it and twisted it before the wire nut so you know those things aren't going anywhere. Now wire nuts are super inexpensive, they're common, you can buy them in a pretty large bin like this and this is enough to last you for a lot of jobs especially if you're just doing this as a homeowner. Wire nuts when done properly are one of the cheapest and most effective ways to join wires. Now one quick tip for working with combinations of solid wire and stranded wire is that you actually want to have the stranded wire stick out a little bit further than the solid wire. That helps the wire nut to actually wrap it all the way around and it kind of twists it around so that it makes a better and more solid connection. If you put them at the same length then what tends to happen is that stranded wire doesn't have enough chance to bite and grab on and then it's easier just to pull out which is obviously not what you want. Now this kind of fell apart as I was handling it but I ran it through the sander just to open it up and show you how well these uh, different wires, both the stranded and the solid, are connected on the inside. So a wire cap done well, or a wire nut, will do a pretty excellent job. Another great option for joining wires together is what's called the plumber's crack. No, that's not it. The butt joint, it's called a butt joint. So with the butt joint, what that does is allows you to slide two wires into a metal casing, and it typically either has a heat shrink enclosure or a standard plastic enclosure on it. And then you crimp those metal casings down, and it squishes those wires into place and creates that conductivity from one wire to the other. Now this can be really effective, but it's key that you use the right size butt joint and the right gauge for the gauge of wires that you're doing. If you use one that's too small or too big, it's just not gonna work and it's not gonna hold. Even if it holds temporarily, it's much more likely to break away later on. The other downside with this is that you often have to have a proper ratcheting crimping tool. A good crimping tool like this can cost quite a bit, but most of your wire strippers, lineman's pliers, and other tools probably already have a little bit of a crimping tool built in even if it's not the ideal one. My six in ones, for example, have a little crimper built in there, but it does have limited applications. It's not gonna work for all sizes and all gauges of butt joints, but if that happens to be the right one, then great, go ahead and use that, and that way you don't have to use a separate ratcheting tool. A huge step up from the butt connectors is what's called a solder seal wire connectors. And now there are different names for this, just like in many things, because there are different products and different brands, but this is super clever. These are designed in such a way that you only need one tool to apply these, and that is heat. That can even be something as simple as a lighter, though I definitely suggest that you use either a butane torch or better than that, a heat gun. So with a heat gun applied on here and you get that thing warmed up, these little ends here will shrink down and grab onto the wires on either end and they'll create a nice seal there. And then as you focus the heat in the middle, it will melt that solder, which will bleed into the wires themselves and then will make it so that they have a nice solid connection. Now this isn't the very best connection that you can get, but it is a pretty close second. And especially since it seals the entire thing and makes it all in one shot with just heat, these are super convenient. So you can see how tough these guys are. When I tried pulling that apart, all I got was to pull all of the sheeting off the rest of the cable and that solder joint held on super well. From this view, you can see what a great job this solder did at penetrating through that entire set of wires. So that's pretty impressive right there. Let's give it a pull test and see if this thing can come apart at all. Can we get the braking there and I'm pulling the sheathing off again. Once again, it pulled all that sheathing right off because it would rather separate from the sheathing then break that bond that it's created with the solder. So very impressive. You can buy an entire 150 piece kit like this for just 10 bucks on Amazon. I'll put links to that in the description below. And it has all different sizes and it has quite a few of each of them. And for joining stranded wires, it doesn't get easier. 
and almost doesn't get stronger or more efficient than getting these. It's a pretty fantastic little invention. The last method that we'll discuss today for joining stranded wires is to use a soldering iron and some heat shrink tubing. While this technique may be a little off-putting or intimidating to some, I'm going to walk you through step by step to show you the tips to make this work successfully and that way it will produce the strongest and best way to join two wires together. You'll also need some solder and I highly recommend getting something like this that's rosin core. So it's got this rosin paste flux, it's got this inside of it. So it's got both the solder and the rosin and it just makes the job that much easier. You don't have to deal with this stuff quite as much, though you can still use this as well. It doesn't hurt. Another accessory that's really nice to have is a set of helping hands like these and these can hold your, wait, no, not those ones, these ones, helping hands and these can hold your wires while you're working. Little magnifying glass. This is a pretty inexpensive little setup and it's totally flexible and adjustable and it just makes it so that you can have something holding your wires in place as you hold both the solder and the soldering iron. This is another item that's totally optional but can really help. If you're not able to work in a well ventilated area because fumes and smoke will come up while you solder, you can use a fume extractor like this and it has a filter on here and then a fan and it basically will just suck all of that smoke up and filter it out as you work, which is really convenient. Now to begin our soldering process, first we need to slide on our heat shrink tubing and we're gonna put that as far away as you can from the area that we're gonna solder. Then we're gonna connect the wires and you wanna twist these together so that they're as tight as can be. And there's different schools of thought on what's best here, but for this demo, we're just gonna do a, a simple twist and we're gonna get it as tight as can be. So something like that should work great. Then I'm gonna use the helping hands and just have it hold everything in place for me. There's our line, and then I'm gonna turn on our fume extractor. We're gonna start off by doing what's called tinning the wire. And that means we're gonna put a little bit of solder right on top. We're gonna to just melt it right off the end of our soldering iron onto the wire. Don't need a whole lot, but this does a couple of things. One, it makes it easier for the solder to get down in there. And two, it gives us a little bit of a sign as to when it's ready. I'm then gonna place the soldering iron tip underneath the wire. I'm gonna press firmly against the bottom of the connection here, and it's gonna heat up that wire. It's conductive metal, so it'll pull that heat through, and then it's gonna to start to melt that solder right up on top there. Seeing a little bit of movement starting to happen already in that solder, that's good. I'm gonna move it around just a little bit to make sure it gets all of the different portions of the wire. So as I touch the wire itself, not the soldering iron, but the wire. It's gonna pull that solder down through because it's got that resin inside of it. It's a resin core. It's gonna to try to spread and travel as much as it can, which is great. And that's maybe even a little bit too much there, but that's plenty. Don't need any more than that. And you can see as I move it, it's melting along with it, which means we've got plenty on there. Don't forget to always wash off the tip of your soldering iron with a sponge here. That keeps it clean and keeps the residue off of it makes it so that it's just perfectly ready to go next time. Now we're almost done here. We still have to do the heat shrink. You can see it's wrapping tightly around our wire, which is great, and around our joint, and there we have it. So this is now an extremely strong connection with excellent conductivity, and this will last for ages. Now that you've seen the different methods, I'd love to hear which one you prefer in the comments section below. My name is Nils with Learn to DIY. Thanks for watching.